an honor to be here. Thank you so much for that warm introduction. And thank you so much. I just want to say before I get started, I just want to pay honor to our bishop and our pastor this morning. I know I do this every time I'm up here, but I feel like it's so important that we do that. Because while preparing for this message, I'm reminded every time that I prepare to speak, which is only a couple of times a year, that they do it two or three times a week. And it's a lot easier to prepare a word a couple times a year because you got a lot to say. <laughs> You're never up here. But when you're having to look for a fresh word two and three times a week, a word that's going to minister to the hearts and lives of you all, they don't come up here and take it lightly. It's not an easy assignment at all. They come up here to minister to your life so God can speak to you so that his promises can be evident in your life. Amen? Amen. So let's give them honor this morning. I also want to say happy Mother's Day to all the mothers. I know it's been said a lot, but happy Mother's Day. And to all the soon-to-be mothers, you're not forgotten. If you're with child, you're a mother as well. So happy Mother's Day to you. And I'd also like to say a special happy Mother's Day to my mother-in-law, my other mother. <laughs> Pastor Debbie Shipman, behind every great man is a mighty praying woman, and she is that. And we will never know the price that she and Bishop have paid for us to be here. We wouldn't be here if it weren't for them for the 45, 45 years of ministry. And you see everything in this house. You see the packed house. You see the great music and the choir and everything. But it wasn't always like this. There was a price that had to be paid for it all. And I'm thankful that I don't have to pay that price. They've already done it. And we're able to be here and, and uh, enjoy in, in the fruit that they, have, that they have harvested. Amen. 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 You may be seated. Thank you for that. Thank you. This morning, we're going to talk about a mother. No surprise there. A mother who, is in, who was in crisis. Her world and everything she knew was in a state of despair and panic. And life as she knew it was falling apart. Turn with me to 2 Kings, verse 4. And it's a story that we all know, and if you don't know, you're going to hear it this morning. 2 Kings, chapter 4, verse 1. And it's the story of Elisha and the widow's oil. A certain woman of the wives of the, son of, the of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elisha saying, Your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that your servant feared the Lord. And the creditor is coming to take my two sons to be his slaves. So Elisha said to her, What shall I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? And she said, your maidservant has nothing in the house but a jar of oil. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning. Lord, I would be remiss if I didn't give this service over to you. Lord, I am your mouthpiece. Use me. Let my words be your words, Father. It is not about me. It is not about any of us here. Lord, it is about you. It's all about you, Lord Jesus. I give this service over to you. Have your way. Holy Spirit, take over. Take control. We give you full reign this morning in your holy, precious name. Amen. Amen. This woman is experiencing pain on every level. In every area of her life, you, can, you just read in those first two verses the amount of pain she's experiencing. First of all, she's in emotional pain because her husband just died. And we know she's in pain because it says she cried out. And you don't cry out unless you're in pain. I'd imagine everything within her just wanted to stay in bed, to close the blinds, tune the world out. Could you imagine the pain of losing your spouse? She had lost the person who she was to spend the rest of her days with. It wasn't like now where the divorce rate is 50%. 
The person you married was the person you stayed with. So the person she was supposed to spend the rest of her days with, the father of her children, the person who was to care for her, to be her, to her provider, her protector, all of that is now gone, and she's hurting. Number two, she's in financial pain. The creditors are at her door knocking, and they're asking her to pay a debt that she cannot pay. These creditors don't care that she just lost her husband. And it was probably a sudden loss because back then you didn't know about a whole lot about diseases. There was no MRIs, there was no blood tests, there was no CT scans. So there was nothing to warn you of like a pre-existing illness. And it was very easy to get hurt during this time period. So even though we don't know for sure, the chances of her husband's death being sudden is higher than not. So now she's faced with carrying this financial burden alone with no means to pay. So she's in financial pain. Number three, she's in maternal or parental pain. And I imagine at this point, she probably feels like her only reason to live is her two sons. But yet even that is at the brink of being lost. Her legacy, her name, her future is at risk of being stolen from her. She probably feels like a failure, failure because as most mothers do, she is probably thinking about the pain her children are going through. Having just lost their father and now possibly losing their mother too. And their freedom and everything in the world that they know is at risk of being gone. Their home might be stripped away and they are to be sold off into slavery to pay a debt that they did not incur. It was not even theirs. Could you imagine you bringing up a, a debt and the creditor, a Visa, MasterCard, coming to your door and wanting to take your children away for it? I mean, we don't think about it like that. We just read the scripture and we think, oh, well, you know, it's just a story. If you really think about it in today's context, I couldn't imagine. Number four, she's in physical pain because in verse two it says she only has a small, a small jar of oil. So there's no food and she's, she's hungry. She's in physical pain. And I imagine what little food she could scrap up, if any at all, she would give to her children, not herself, just like us mothers would do today. That's right. We give to them first. And number five, and this is the most, the worst pain possible, she's in spiritual pain because she and her husband have served the Lord faithfully. So where is he? Don't you see me, God? Why are you allowing this? There is no greater pain than being at rock bottom and feeling like God has turned his back on you. Nothing hurts more than to be a faithful servant, but feeling like you can't find him when you need him the most. Amen? This woman has not only lost her husband, her finances, and now possibly her sons, but where's the payoff for serving God? God, I've done all these things for you, and you've left me, so it seems. So she tells Elisha, and you see in verse 2, my husband was a faithful servant. Our family is a God-fearing family. She wants the prophet to know that they have served God faithfully because something's not right. This is not what should be in store for her and her family, those that love and serve the Lord. So here she is at the brink of losing everything, and now she has come to the prophet, which begs the question, what is a prophet? A prophet is, de is defined as one appoint appointed by God himself to be his messenger. In other words, a prophet is one who says what God is saying. She has come to the prophet because she needs a word from the Lord. Her circumstances are that of which only God can fix. Have you ever been in a situation that only God can fix? You may be in one of those situations right now. For those of you who don't know if you're in one of those situations that God only can fix, it's when everything is going wrong. <laughs> it's when you tried everything and nothing works. You will never discover all that God, all that God is until you get to the place that God is all you have. When rock bottom looks good to you compared to where you are, the only one that can get you out is God. So the widow goes to the prophet to get a prophetic word. 
Now, let me just make a side note. It's important to watch out for false prophets, especially when you're in a place of desperation, like this widow. Because when you're desperate, we're willing to listen to just about anybody who sounds like they might have a word or a solution for your dilemma, especially if it sounds like a good one. You know, I'm reminded when I was, some of you may know and some of you don't know, but when I was in the thick of my health issues for nine years, experiencing excruciating jaw pain, had three open joint surgeries where they went in and debrided the bone. And actually, Sharon's here this morning. There she is right there. She was so instrumental. I thank you every day for being so instrumental in my healing because I couldn't have done it without you. She was my physician, and she would pray over me every time I would go into her office. And you don't find a doctor like that. Amen. So uh, if you want her number, you can come find me. after. <laughs> she may kill me. <laughs> but when I was in the thick of all of this mess, you, <laughs> you name it, I tried it. Acupressure, surgery, acupuncture, everything. I tried massage therapy, chiropractors. I tried everything, spent a fortune. The pain of my situation was so intense that it clouded my judgment. And it was like a wall standing in front of me and I couldn't see anything but the wall. I was so desperate to get out of the pain that I was in that I made a lot of, decision, a lot of decisions based on my pain rather than wisdom. And that's a dangerous place to be because when you make decisions based on pain, you make choices that are outside of God's will and you get answers to problems you might never have had had you been led by God's word rather than your pain. Let's go back to the scripture. So the widow has run out of answers and so she goes to Elisha the prophet and says, let's reread the, let's re -read the scripture. In verse 1 it says, your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know your servant, fear of the Lord. And the creditor is coming to me to take my two sons to be his slaves. So Elisha said to her, what shall I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? What Elisha says to the widow here is important and crucial. Elisha the prophet asks her, what shall I do for you? Tell me. The reason it's important and crucial is because... Immediately after he asks her a question, what shall I do for you? He doesn't allow her to answer. Why is he asking her a question but doesn't allow her to answer? The question he poses to her is almost rhetorical. It's to point out to the widow that she has come to him because all other avenues have failed. And now you've come to me to seek a word from the Lord. Because you have come to me, it's because you're looking for another answer to get you out of your mess. What your family members have said have failed. What your friends have told you have failed. Your financial planner, your financial planner has failed. Your bank has failed. Now you have come to me because every other thing you tried didn't work. So don't expect me to tell you something you've already heard and expect a different outcome. I'm about to ask you a question and tell you to do something. That might sound a little crazy and strange, but remember, you came to me. Then he asks, what do you have in your house? The widow says, all I have is a small jar of oil. Then Elisha goes on to say in verse 3, then he said, go gather vessels from everywhere, from all your neighbors, empty vessels. Do not gather just a few. Notice Elisha emphasizes empty vessels. Anything that holds something that doesn't already have something in it, gather it up from all your neighbor, neighbors. And don't just gather up a few. Elisha is saying, I not only want you, I, don't, I not only want your house to be empty, but I want you to gather up all the emptiness from your neighbors. So Elisha is saying her nothingness, her emptiness that she's been experiencing is about to not decrease, increase. Before it is ever filled. Not only that, but he says, take the little bit of oil you have and pour it into your neighbor's empty jars. Maybe Elisha didn't hear her correctly, but she only has a little bit of oil. And he wants her to pour that little bit into her neighbor's emptiness. Now the widow has a decision to make here. 
She can either say, this is crazy, you quack, you crazy old man, it makes no sense, everyone will think I'm nuts, I think you're nuts, my neighbor is going to judge me and wonder what's going on, thanks but no thanks, since I can't make sense of it in my mind, I'll pass on the answer that God has sent to deliver me and wait for provision that I can make sense of. Or she can say, maybe this prophet really does have a word from the Lord. Maybe he's on to something. Maybe he knows something I don't know that I can't understand in my human mind. But nevertheless, I will trust in the word that the Lord has sent. What is God testing her here? Her obedience. Her obedience. Her answer has nothing to do with the physical acts. But it has everything to do with her obedience to complete the act as a sign of her faith in God and his promise to deliver her. He could have sent a wealthy man knocking to her door with a bag full of money. After all, she was a servant of the Lord. She loved the Lord. Her husband loved the Lord. The Lord saw her need without her having to ask anything from him. But it wasn't until she put a demand on God's word and then completed the act of faith that her answer arrived. How many of us remember a few weeks ago the business owners in the house that Pastor Whitney had asked all the business, I think it was a Wednesday, it was a Wednesday. Pastor Whitney asked all the business owners to come down and he was going to pray over them. And God had given him a word earlier that day to have the business owners place a rock at the front door of their offices or at their workplace, place of business. You remember that? Who was here for that? You remember that? Okay. Well, as I was preparing this message, that thought came to me because it's an act of obedience. And I began to wonder just how many of us obeyed that word in which God will honor if he did. But then I wonder how many of us did not obey that word? How many of us thought nothing of it? Not, not maliciously, but maybe out of just laziness or forgetfulness. But we wonder then why our businesses aren't producing like we need them to. We wonder why God hasn't brought the provision we need. We pray and hope for an answer, but when God brings a word, we fail to respond to it. Some of us are getting a word that has an answer connected to it, just like the prophet Elisha had an answer connected to what he was asking her to do. But because we failed to do the act, we failed to obey what the prophet has said, the word that God has given, we failed to activate God's blessing in our life. Now in verse 4 it says, When you have come in, you shall shut the door behind you and your sons, then pour into all those vessels and set aside the full ones. Elisha gives specific instructions here that only the widow and her sons were to be present for the miracle that was about to take place. Why is that? Why is that? Because only those that have the faith to act on it can witness it. There are some of us here today that are believing for a breakthrough, for a word to meet their need that only God can meet. But understand that everyone in your life cannot be present to witness God's answers and God's provisions. Let's take that even a step further. Some of us are in a room where God's power will show itself. We're right there. We're right at the helm of it. We're, we're, we're sitting in the place that God is about to show himself true. He's about to give you. He's about to deliver that promise that he has given to you, that he has promised you. But there's some people in the room with you that shouldn't be there. And because of that, our miracle is stunted. Now, don't get me wrong. There are people, God has sent some people in your life to stand with you and believe for God's answers. And that thing you've been praying for, that thing that only God can do. But there are a lot more naysayers than there are believers. They may say they believe, but in their heart of hearts, they don't. Just call it whatever. It may not be out of jealousy or anything, but it just may be out of our simple human mindedness, just trying to grasp what God has said. They may say they believe, but they really don't. 
That's why it's important to pray for discernment and wisdom. Your breakthrough might be halted because of something or someone you're not even aware of. That's why in Hosea chapter 4, verse 6, it says, My people are destroyed from a lack of knowledge. Lack of knowledge. Don't ever take for granted the knowledge that God has bestowed upon you, that God has made available to you. You should invest in knowledge. A lot of times we lack because we just, we just don't know this word. We just don't know the promises of God. Invest in this. It'll be the best investment you make. Let's go back to the scripture. Verse 5. So she went from him and shut the door behind her and her sons who brought the vessels to her and she poured out into it. Now it came to pass when the vessels were full that she said to her son, bring me another vessel. He said to her, there is not another vessel. So the oil ceased. Notice that the blessing stopped when her neighbor's emptiness was filled. The end of the story is in verse 7. It says, then it came and then she came and told the man of God. And he said, go sell the oil and pay your debt. And you and your sons shall live on the rest to retire on. Could you imagine having enough provision that you're able to pay off every debt, your house, every credit card, everything, and still have enough to live off of? Not just not just exist, but thrive off of. Enjoy your life, not just for you, but your children and their families. Because she first poured what little she had into others' emptiness, God not only met her need, but he provided more than enough for her and her sons to retire and to live comfortably off the rest of their lives. When we give to others what we ourselves need from God, it pours, it opens up the channels for God's blessings to flow to us. You say, I don't have what, my neighbor, what I need to give to my neighbors. You can have a little. Just have a little like she had. She just had a little bit of oil. We see the promise. We see that promise in Luke 6, 38. It says, give and it shall be given unto you. And that's why also in Acts 20, verse 35, it says, it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. Now, on the other side of that, by hoarding God's blessings, by not giving to your neighbor, we cut off God's flow. And believe me, if you can't, if God says he can't flow, if he sees that he can't flow through you, he won't flow to you. He wants to see what he can get through you, and he'll bless you. There are some people that you might see, and you're like, man, how on earth are they so blessed? God knows he can get it through them. He does. He does, and that's why if you are a blessing to others, he will make sure that you are more than well taken care of. More than well taken care of. Another thing I want us to notice was that at the beginning of the passage about the widow and the oil, her whole life was in distress. She was on the brink of losing it all. Everything, starting in verse 1. However, in just six verses, she goes from losing everything to having more than enough for herself and her children. When God gets ready to move, it doesn't take a long time. You may be saying, well, yeah, it does. It, it feels like it does. Maybe you need to go visit your neighbor. Maybe you need to get a hold of what God's word is saying. Get a hold of the prophetic word that God has, and he'll move quickly. That's why we call it a now word. If it doesn't feel like you're getting the provision quickly, it might be because you're relying on man, my, mankind's solution rather than the prophetic word of God. It's easier to believe what everybody else is saying. It's easier to believe what you're saying to yourself than it is to act. I mean, this is craziness. Could you imagine? I mean, you know, not craziness, but craziness to the naked eye, one who doesn't have the discernment of the spirit. Could you imagine somebody coming to your house and you're saying, I, 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 I don't have anything? And they, they, Pastor Whitney tells you, 
go get all the Tupperware and everything from all your neighbors. <laughs> and we're going to take this bag of gold and we're just going to dump it out until you... I mean, that sounds insane. It's no different today than it was back then. God says he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. If, he'll, if he did it then, he'll do it today. Amen? We just limit him in our own minds. In closing, I, I just want to leave you with this final thought. When God moved in the widow's life, he did, through, he did so through a tiny jar of oil. With that jar of oil, she was able to fill all of her neighbor's jars and her very own jars. And her sons and her were able to live debt-free for the rest of their lives. God doesn't need a lot to do a lot. He can take a jar of oil and turn it into a lifelong inheritance. He can take a stick and give it to a man by the name of Moses and with that stick slay an army and part the Red Sea. He can take a shepherd boy, a stick, a rubber band, and a stone, put it in the hands of him, of a little boy, and use that slingshot to slay a giant. He can take the jawbone of a donkey and put it in the hands of Samson and use it to, sl to slay a thousand Philistines. He can use a little boy, some bread and fish, and use it to feed 5,000. God can take a little and do a great big thing. If we're willing to trust in him and put those small things in his hands, the sky is the limit. You say, I don't have any money. That's okay. Put it in God's hands. He'll make a way. You're saying, I don't have an education. Put it in God's hands. He'll make a way. You said, I'm less than. My family has cursed me. That's okay. Put your faith in him, and he'll make you ruler over many. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God can do a great big thing with something little. Whose hands are you going to put your little thing in? He'll make you great. He'll make you mighty, ladies. Put your faith in him. Put your hope in him. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.